This episode of Headlock Talk is brought to you by... Austin-based company Naturally Hemp's and their new line of CBD gummies. These gummies are made with 100% baked-in, pharmaceutical-grade, non-isolate-based CBD. What we're talking about here is the entourage effect. The entourage effect refers to the stronger effect you get when combining multiple cannabinoids together as opposed to just CBD. Full-spectrum CBD or CBD distillate tends to be more potent and last longer, which is what we're talking about here. Unlike some other brands that use a spray-on CBD, Naturally Hemp CBD distillate is baked in so you know you're getting the full dose with each gummy. I personally use them for all kinds of things, like sleep aid or muscle pain. And did I mention they taste great? They got five flavors. Uh, strawberry, green apple, lemon lime, watermelon, and get this, the orange flavor has vitamin C in it. Ooh. So, if this sounds like something you could go for, head over to your nearest Creative Sig vape shop and pick yours up today to see for yourself the difference Naturally Hemp's gummies can make in your life. On this week's episode of Headlock Talk, I am joined by pro wrestling writer and historian Rob Wilkins as we take a look at the careers and rivalries of two of the greatest of all time, Bret the Hitman Hart and the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels. Alrighty, what is going on, everybody? It is time yet again for another episode of Headlock Talk presents Wrestling Lore. Yes, indeed. I am the Texas Gentleman Tanner Pruitt, and uh, along with me today it is a man. You know him. You love him. You've heard from him all this series. Uh, pro wrestling uh, writer and historian uh, and journalist extraordinaire, Mr. Rob Wilkins. Rob, I really couldn't find a better person to talk about today's subject. Oh, man, I, I appreciate this very much. This this subject is something that I've been, you know, it's, it's something that so many people have opinions on. You've heard it over and over from a lot of people. And, you know, the, the thing that I love is we're talking about one of my favorite wrestlers of all time. And, uh, this is going to be fun. I, I I've enjoyed everything else that we've done, but mm. this one, this is this is like, all right, let's go. Th- this so, yeah, you're, you. you're, yeah, you're very welcome, and thank you for you know indulging me in this one here because uh, I'll be perfectly honest. This this subject was not on my list simply for two reasons. Uh, one, like you said, a lot of people have talked about it. Though I don't think I've ever been given the opportunity to talk at length about it, and and you've definitely liberated that for me here today. Uh, secondly, uh, my 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 masters in command over at Love Wrestling, who th- th- will also have this stream. They're they're based out of Canada, and I'm sure that they will definitely feel a certain way about this particular subject. Uh, but uh, you know what? Confines be damned today, Rob. We're going to talk about uh, Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels, two of the greatest wrestlers and performers of all time in this great sport of pro wrestling, uh, and and their rivalry, really. Um, Rob, a, a lot of people talk about Montreal and what happened uh, at that Survivor Series in 1997. Uh, but I get, I get a large sense that many, many people uh, focus on that as opposed to all of the rest of the rivalry that that these two have here. Yeah, yeah, you know it's, and it's, uh, it went from. You know, the, their their careers are similar. You know, they they both when they were both tag team, both tag team wrestlers. Like at the beginning of their careers, like when they came or when Bret Hart came to the United States to wrestle for Vince, um, and Shawn Michaels obviously with the Rockers. You know, they they had similar uh, 
career, like going the going the go, rising up. You know, like Bret Hart was with Hart Foundation, and um, Vince went with Bret over Sean, like for the uh, for the push. But Shawn Michaels was right there with him. I mean, Shawn Michaels, Intercontinental Champion, when Bret Hart was defending his World Champion. So Shawn Michaels was in the wings, and uh, I don't know, like, I don't know if there was something that that happened where like he went with Bret over Shawn per se. But I think it was because of he saw obviously he saw more into Bret at the time. And Shawn Michaels, he he had the charisma. Like when when you think about the Rockers, I always looked at Shawn Michaels as like the main guy. Just kind of like with Heart Foundation, I looked at Brett as the main guy. Right. Um, so the, these two, they're. I think what's so fascinating is these two were pretty similar all the way up to that infamous night in 1997. Oh, for sure, and. Uh, and maybe I'm being oversimplifying or maybe I'm being so abstract about it. Um, but when I hear Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels together, um, I, I immediately think of, you know, it's early 90s WWF at the time. Um, McMahon's going, you know, post steroid trial. Right. Um, and because of Hulk Hogan and who he was and because of how a lot of the guys on the roster looked at the time and, you know, uh, arguably because Lex Luger was not a huge hit immediately right out of the gate. He was not the perfect solution to Hulk Hogan. McMahon changes pace and goes with guys of ability. Um, First up being Bret Hart. So so if if I was a person who knew absolutely nothing about pro wrestling, um, what would you tell me, Rob, about Bret Hart? What is what is the quintessential ethos of Bret Hart? You know, the I think what it comes to me is um, technical wrestling. You know, like he's he's one of the greatest technical wrestlers um, there's been. Um, you look at other technical wrestlers like Dean Malenko, but the thing is, Bret Hart had that. People could relate to Bret Hart more than than your Dean Malenkos and uh, like Dynamite Kid and uh, stuff like that. So, Bret, and that wasn't just United States; that was across the world. Bret Hart. Was, there was something about Brett in different countries other than the United States where he was just like a, a, a wrestling god. Like Germany, mm. he was huge. Mm-hmm. Um, he was big and like wherever he went overseas, he was like a. I'm not. I'm not kidding when I say this. They treated him like a rock god. Like yeah, that's how popular he was, and that was something that. <laughs> It's weird. He, like he, he obviously loved it. And WWE, for the most part, Vince was surprised. Like it was one of those things where, I he's he's so so big, he's so bigger. Like here, like popularity wise. And that was one of the things that led up to like right before Brett left the WWF, is Brett thought the him having a problem with the United States would actually help him again with, with his career, like with Canada and uh, like other countries. Like he was Mm -hmm. a fate. It was weird. There's no, there's never been a wrestler that I can remember where he was a complete face wherever else he was, except for the United States. Mm -hmm. He was in the United States and he was getting booed. And now Bret Hart was one of my favorite wrestlers. So (laughs) I, I rooted for him and, I mean the the United States thing that was I I got it then it was a gimmick you know what I mean like mm-hmm. I understood but he was still my favorite wrestler mm-hmm. and uh, I love the Hart Foundation and everything behind it but it was just it 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 just 
when it comes to Bret Hart, I he's on my Mount Rushmore. That's the easiest way to say it. He's on my Mount Rushmore. I know you hear about everybody else's Mount Rushmore, and it's obviously different, but Bret would yeah. be on mine. Oh, one hundred percent. And and I'm glad that you've. I mean, you said a lot of things that I want to touch on. Um, I mean, the the Mount Rushmore part. Um, I actually saw something. I think it was something that Stone Cold Steve Austin said, and in that you have to. Uh, I think his words were, "You have to have Hulk Hogan and Ric Flair on your Mount Rushmore." Period. Um, where whereas it, in my belief, you have to have Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels on your Mount Rushmore, and and probably Steve Austin as well. And I I mean, if you put a gun to my head, I would I would probably say Ric Flair. Yeah, my Mount Rushmore uh, consists of six guys, so it's it's, uh, it's, it's hard for just four because they they each have a, a huge um, they were they played each, they each played a huge part of pro wrestling yeah. um, at different times, and um, that's that's why mine would be it's hard to say Mount Rushmore. It's it's easier to say like. Oh, I don't. I don't really know as an example, but you know, there, it's it's just hard to pick four. So, so you've got more of a Mount Olympus of of wrestling. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, that'd probably be the best way. <laughs> and that's the thing. Like that's the thing now. When I watch wrestling, like look, like it's it's being like hammered home with everybody that WWE's product hasn't been the best. But when I watch it, I don't. I never blame a wrestler. I don't blame them ever. I never like. I don't. It's it's storytelling. I don't. I don't mm. think any of them suck. You know. I I don't. I like Baron Corbin. I think. I think he's doing an amazing job because his job. To give you an example, you're not supposed to like him at all. Like yeah. He, he gets under your skin and he does his job perfectly. Yeah. He, and that's his. That's his job and he does it well. And granted, he has that look of just like obnoxious. And he did that so well, and, and in a way, that reminds me of Bret Hart with the Canadian versus U.S. angle. He just looked very smug, but then when he was across the border, just it was it was opposite. It was like just a it was just a new person, His, mm-hmm. and it just fascinates me today. Well, and and the other thing that I love, and, and we'll move on to our our other. Uh, a person of interest here in just a moment. But the other thing that I love about what you had said is, uh, you know, Bret Hart being a, a rock star, you know, wherever he went. And ev- even in the U.S. in the early days, because we can go back to WrestleMania 10 era Bret Hart, where he was, you know, untouchable, right? Um, Bret Hart was... Uh, the the it and it's so cliche I know, but he really is the living embodiment of the best there is, the best there was, the best there ever will be. He lived and breathed those words, right? He was the perfect solution, in my opinion, to somebody like Ric Flair, who was technical. He was the you know, Ric Flair being the wrestler, right? Bret Hart brings that technical edge that, you know, hey, I can bring you superb match quality out of this. But it's not just that. From an entertainment value standpoint, Bret Hart walks out to the ring. He's got this rock music that, you know, I mean, we're we're used to like the, you know, the real American, you know, like, you know, <laughs> by, by Hulk, you know, the Hulk Hogan theme song and like uh, Randy Savage using, uh, you know, that that classical music piece and this, that and the other. But Bret Hart had like a legit like rock song that he walked out to. He walks out with the sunglasses, the leather jacket with the fray, you know, on it. Um, I mean, he was the embodiment of cool, right? Like you, you wanted to be Bret Hart. You wanted to be the kid that Bret Hart handed his sunglasses to, right? And then yep. he goes out and has this killer match on a nightly basis. <laughs> yeah, and and that's like what you 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 just said it right there. And before I forget, I was not comparing Baron Corbin to Bret Hart. I'm just saying, like, from, from the character standpoint, I don't want anybody to think that. I, I, will, I like it for different reasons. Now, mm. what you said about Bret Hart, like you wanted to be him. You know, I'm I'm 39 years old right now. Yeah. At that time, Bret Hart, like, was coming into his, like, prime with WWF. 
me mm-hmm. and my little brother, we were having our little matches, you know. And no matter what, we had a we had a rule. Whoever was Bret Hart, they put on the sharpshooter, and that person has to tap out, no matter what. So, <laughs> so that that I mean, that's how much we looked up to him. And and uh, I, I will admit, my brother's sharpshooter was much better than mine. But uh, you know that you you hit it right on the head. Like I wanted to be like Bret Hart when I was. I just thought it was cool. And then like a few years later. Shawn Michaels had that kind of thing when he came back. Like, mm. kid, people just loved him. He's like, this guy can do everything. And, you know, so it's... And the DX thing helped him. And, you know, it, it's just fascinating. I, I I love it. I love this subject. <laughs> <laughs> um, he... Uh, I, I'll admit, I put on a sharpshooter one or two times myself as a, as a child... <laughs> I feel like I was pretty decent at it. Um, but yeah, I mean, Bret Hart was somebody like, he, like not even was he was like that rock star. And I know this is a very loose format, but not only was he like that rock star, but like he was also like pretty humble too, right? Like he, like he wasn't about like cussing or in your face or, and he wasn't like, you know, like this aggro, you know, gym freak like Hulk Hogan, right? This was somebody who was like super humble uh, about where he's from, you know, and just all about like, you know, uh, the aesthetic of, of pro wrestling. Um, we, 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 we've definitely nailed Bret Hart, our contractually obligated, prolonged um, yeah. Sucking up to Bret Hart here, uh, per, per Love Wrestling's uh, <laughs> um, contractual uh, uh, obligations here. Um, let's talk about HBK, the Heartbreak Kid, Shawn Michaels. What, in your opinion, made Shawn Michaels so special, Rob? He he had a he had a like charisma, like pretty much like no other. Like he he when he got in that ring, he, he usually like you always felt like he gave it his all, um, and he and the thing was is he was he was a smooth worker, he was great on the microphone, he was hilarious, you know like like Shawn Michaels when he was a face he like hearing him on the mic hearing him on the mic is like good stuff like he like with DX. Hey, like when DX started, I was not a I was not a DX guy, but I can mm. admit they made me laugh. You know, they 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 did that, and Shawn Michaels could do that. Shawn Michaels just he just gives you this. You know, it, it's one of those things where you see him in the ring, you're gonna get a good match. You just know you're gonna get it. Whether mm-hmm. he's he's gonna put somebody over, like even if he wins, he's still putting people over. I don't know if you remember, uh, I think it was, I can't remember what show it was, but he had a match against Vader. And they killed it. It was a fantastic match. It's I think it's Vader's best WWF match he, he had. And that was the last thing I think anybody at that time would kind of expect that Shawn Michaels and Vader would just have a killer match. And they did. And then that uh, Undertaker versus like you just had so many classic matches with Shawn Michaels in them. You had his matches with Razor Ramon in the in WrestleMania 10 and then SummerSlam 96 or 95 or 96. They had a they had one hell of a ladder match there too. And then you had uh, the Hell in a Cell in 97, I believe too. And uh, just so much going on, and they just and that's the thing. Even before with like Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels wrestling, they had they had good matches. I remember some of their when they both started getting their singles push. Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels had ladder matches, and you could rent them. You could rent one of the matches on like Coliseum Home Video, like one of their <laughs> first match, ladder matches. It was just they just always had free matches, and they they worked really well together for sure. And and, and I think what. Um... What what a lot of people will will look at with Sean is that he was just such a natural for pro wrestling. 
Um, I, he was. I think he was technical, but not in the same sense that Brett was. Sean was a lot more explosive. He was. He was certainly a lot. I, I would say a lot more charismatic, e- even to a fault, perhaps. <laughs> um, he would come out to you know the the the, the sexy boy song. Uh, he would be strutting. He'd have the sequins. He had the the chaps. Right. Uh, he he would do the pose, you know, he you know, the flex pose that he would do. But when he got in the ring, like there was just like this, like intangible thing that was a that 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 that, that Shawn Michaels just had about him. That it was like, dude, you're so good. Like like nobody is doing the things that you do. Right. It's just so ahead of the time, and and I think that's what makes Sean and Brett both so special because not only were they influencing people in ninety four, ninety five, ninety six, you know, but they were they've influenced people even twenty five years on, right? Um, you know, I, and, and that's what's going to make this episode so much fun here. So, uh, Rob, if you if you could throw a dart on a map, uh, on the the map that is the Shawn Michaels Bret Hart rivalry, where would you where would you throw that dart for the the, the beginning point here? Ah, uh, man, great question. Um, I think it starts earlier than people really imagine. I think it started. I think it probably started when Brett got the push. Like, I think that's, that might be when they, like, when they started having, they weren't having big problems, but I think, I think Sean had a little bit of an issue with Brett getting the push over him. Um, and it, it really came into focus when the click came in when the click started run, trying to run things because Vince listened to them. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that's pretty much when Brett started getting irritated with a lot of things with Sean. And, um, you know, that was, that was the thing in, in the locker room. There were two guys that people went to for a lot of things and, and they went to, they went to undertaker more than anything, but Brett Hart was that other guy that people would go to mm-hmm. um, for Shawn Michaels. And, uh, it was it was starting to bother a lot of people um, with just what was going on with the click, and I think that's what I think it started a little bit before the click, but it wasn't a big deal. And then I think the click is what pushed it um, to a new to a newer level. And then mm-hmm. um, I think and, and there's there's nothing like there's no <clears throat> there's no articles out there that back. The series. I know when Brett beat Diesel at, I believe, it was Survivor Series '95. Um, it could have been '96, but there was that kind of felt like when things were starting to turn back towards Brett's favor, um, and eventually it just got to that point where it came contract time, and that's what led to. The big issues. Mm-hmm. Well, and and you got to look at it like this too. Like Brett, Brett took the championship so seriously, and I know you know that you know you get a lot of guys like Scott Hall and Kevin Nash, guys that Shawn Michaels is obviously very friendly with. They're part of the clique. You know that that they'll they'll say, well, you know, Brett is a mark for the business, or Brett was a mark for the title. But yeah, I mean, I, I think in Brett's mind, he was trying to add some kind of semblance of uh, seriousness and professionalism and legitimacy to his his art form, right? And I mean, I think deep down, you know, as a very meta topic and 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 and, and point here, I think that's what everybody kind of wants in their career is. Hey, I, I want to be taken seriously, and that's where he garnered a lot of that respect. And the click was very good at 
disrupting that semblance of um, what what Brett was trying to build. Um, obviously, Brett Brett made his his bones at WrestleMania. Well, he he was champion going into WrestleMania nine, and then you know obviously that was a catastrophe uh, for all intents and purposes. Um, he would win the title back at WrestleMania 10. And I mean, he was kind of the guy from there um, for, for a period of time. He was again, the, the top guy WrestleMania 12 comes around and Shawn Michaels is the guy to challenge Bret Hart 60 minute Iron Man match for the title. At, you know, again, WrestleMania 12, um, I've heard people say it's a great match. I've heard people say, you know, it's, you know, a match kind of for its time. Um, but I think that this is a point in which things escalated. You can watch the match. You can say what you want about the match post match. Shawn Michaels is talking to the referee and saying, you know, get Bret Hart the F out of the ring. This is my moment. Yada, yada, yada. Right. Yeah. Um, and I feel like this is also a, a, a big twist in these two men's professional career arc as far as their rivalry goes is is Sean not necessarily giving Brett the respect of the that the former champion would really get on a normal basis. Yeah, no, exactly. Like, um and, and there's been there's been a, a couple of things like did did uh, did Sean say this did Brett say that um, like with that getting out of the ring thing and there there's I, it's weird I've heard different things obviously and if you read his lips Shawn Michaels lips it, it it's hard to tell like I, I I don't know like and it might have changed. One of them might have came out and said he didn't say this, or maybe he did. Like maybe Shawn Michaels did say, "I did say that," or you know what I mean. I don't. I don't really remember. But you're right. That might have started. That might have started it on Bret Hart's side, where he was like, this "Jackass! I just I just gave him the title, and he's doing this." Like I didn't uh-huh. have to. Like you know, like you know. I think in if that's the case, I could see. I can see why you would be pissed at Shawn Michaels if he did, if he said that. Um, and I would think that's probably where it started on Bret Hart. Um, but it, it really didn't, according to Bret Hart, what, and, and I don't know if you wanted me to skip to this, but what, what got this stuff started with Bret and Shawn Michaels was the Sunny Days comment. That's oh, what okay. That's yeah, what go, really started. Yeah, go um, for it, man. Talk about it. Well, there's there and Tammy Tammy or uh, Tammy Linsich, who was Sunny, um, was ha, was in a relationship with Shawn Michaels um, while she was in a relationship with Chris Candino, Candido, and Shawn Shawn Michaels basically from what Tammy said is Shawn Michaels thought she was with. <laughs> With him and sometimes with Brett, Brett and her have always said they were just like friends. They were they were they were friends. Well, Shawn Michaels kind of made a comment on Raw that Brett's been seeing, Brett's been having some sunny days lately, mm. and that's what like, and Brett was like that's not true. And basically, Shawn Michaels is basically trying to start a problem, is what Brett said, and that was. That was a catalyst, at, like from what everybody believes. That kind of started thing. Now, granted, Brett didn't like the click, running around, basically controlling the show or calling the shots, because he wanted like he thought that should have been a Vince thing or uh, Pat Patterson or Gerald Briscoe or Bruce Pritchard type thing. Mm-hmm. So and it just kind of went from there culminated for sure um and, and i've definitely i mean every everybody out there is probably very familiar with the sunny days comment um that 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 sean made and there was there's been several instances of of sean and brett not um 
not having the nicest things to say about one another, either backstage or, you know, in public, whatever it may be. Um, so I don't know if anybody else watches or li- rather listens to a change in attitude, which is uh, another show that I do with uh, my good friend, uh, my good friends, rather Mags and Ori. Um, but right now we're, we're watching raw 1996. That's about the summertime of 1996. Um, headed into Survivor Series. Sean's the champion, right? And Bret Hart's really nowhere to be found. Um, from my understanding, he's taken... Uh, he took a leave of absence. He was, I think he was working on a TV show at the time, um, uh, post-WrestleMania 12. And all this time, uh, Bret Hart has been, um, I guess negotiating his contract and trying to negotiate a deal uh, with Vince McMahon, um, obviously knowing that WCW is very much interested in what Bret Hart does. Um, in October 1996, uh, Bret Hart was offered a $8.4 million contract for three years from WCW, which was, you know, I mean, it's a lot of money. That's a, that's a ton of money for even what they were paying other wrestlers at the time. Um, and, and now like still that's mm-hmm. like, compared to what some of the wrestlers now are making. I mean, the, to give you an example, FTR, uh, the formerly known as the Re- revival, they were, I think they both were on the record saying they were each offered five hundred thousand dollars to be signed, mm-hmm. like contracts. And I mean, you're talking eight million for Bret Hart, which is a little over two, little over two and a half million, you know, like mm-hmm. per year. And mm-hmm. that's that's how much they were paying. Granted, Warner, Time Warner, and Turner had a lot more money than. Vince McMahon at that time, so they could do that, but that's also what led to, to their demise. So, oh, well, of course, and I, what W what WWF uh, responded with is an unprecedented twenty year contract. Vince McMahon offered, a, uh, according to multiple different sources, a twenty year contract, which would see him being not only the highest paid professional wrestler. You know, um, but also uh, give him some rights, some creative rights, um, as far as his character is concerned, and um, a major role within management post wrestling. Right, so he'd be like this ambassador type figure for WWF, and that's what Brett really went for is you know Brett's wanting to kind of stamp his legacy on pro wrestling WWF being the place to do it I don't think he was nearly as interested in the money as what he was interested in his legacy and being loyal to to Vince at the time um one piece of the story that we really need to note here um, and, and this is where you can definitely, you know, give me your two cents on this uh, here, Rob. Uh, WWF financially, despite making this offer to Bret Hart, was not doing super well considering the, um, I, I guess, the impact of WCW on the business. WCW obviously was really, really cutting into WWF's earnings at the time. Yeah, they and it was even it was even worse than that. I mean, the, there was, I mean, there were times where Vince, there was a time where Vince actually thought they might not make it. You know, that's how bad things were. And and I'll give you an example. I remember um, getting tickets for a house show when I lived in Tallahassee, Florida, and they canceled the show the day of. And I remember, like, I was obviously I was disappointed because. I was going to get to go to a WWF house show and it got canceled. And I remember asking the civic center, why did it get canceled? And they literally said, we only sold 112 tickets. 
I lived in Tallahassee, Florida, a city with over a th- hundred thousand people. They sold Ooh. under a hundred or one hundred twelve tickets, and I remember that because, like, I I'll never forget it. I'm like a hundred one hundred twelve. I remain. I remember asking. So, well, and and not just that and always not to, stuck with me. Well, and not to cut you off, but like we think of Florida right now. Uh, I mean, Florida. I mean, lives and breathes pro wrestling. And yeah. it has for quite some time. So for for you to be a part of an event that gets canceled, um, that I mean, with the reasoning being they only sold 112 tickets, is uh, shocking, really. Yeah. If I'm being yeah. honest. Yeah, because uh, about and this just shows how the product was in in Florida. WCW was still huge in Florida because a year earlier, WCW had a house show and. There were tons of people there, and people that weren't even in the company came and like hung out. Like you had, uh, Gordon Soley was at this house show. I got to meet him. I mean, you just had so many big people. Like it was, it was people that traveled, that lived in Florida. They would go to the show when WCW, and that just showed me right then how NWA WCW was much bigger in Florida than WWF was, and that tells me how bad things were for WWF. Like you had, they were known like WWF was the big, they were the, the big dog <laughs> to say, you know, and that's when I realized that, wow, wrestling is not, nobody liked wrestling at that time. I mean, mm-hmm. when you, when you think about it, just, it wasn't popular from, pretty much 92 to 96 it was kind of dead i mean it was still obviously going but and then pretty much wcw started the brought it back because of the monday night wars but it just wasn't as popular Mm -hmm. and that you notice that's when brett and sean got their got their pushes like Mm -hmm. Bret hart won the 93 king of the ring um he won. He beat Flair, I think, in '92 for the WWF Championship in in Canada, Saskatchewan, I believe. So it just it just wasn't there popularity wise. WWF was was struggling, and Brett and Sean had mainly Brett had the the had to try to carry the company, and it just mm-hmm. if you look at the finance like financial numbers. It just didn't happen, and I don't, I don't, you can't, I don't believe you can blame that on Bret Hart. I, I honestly don't. I know, well, like, yeah, I know Razor Ramon or Scott Hall, and I know people have made their have made their opinions on it, but I honestly think that you you just couldn't put that all on him, right? Well, and and one thing that that makes this, I, I, I guess, that kind of. It, it is the the domino that makes all the other dominoes fall. Um, it, it it was always Vince McMahon's intention to take WWF public, right? Um, he wanted them to be a publicly traded company. He believed that was the big step for them to be a financial powerhouse. You know that that was his dream, and basically because he was trying to push the company in that direction. Uh, that resulted in him having to um, basically shore up or or rather um, be non-committal to uh, any kind of long-term financial relationships. And this is really what caused, you know, guys like Scott Hall and Kevin Nash and Randy Savage and so many other guys to jump ship and go to WWF because, or to go to go to WCW rather than stay in WWF because they wanted to make the money and that's that's just business right yeah. um, but it's also business on WWF's end in that they have this you know financial pursuit that they're trying to make and they simply can't afford to make you know to, to match the commitments that WCW was doing at the time and in Vince McMahon's eyes. That's P 
people de- being disloyal. That's people leaving, jumping ship. You can use whatever you know metaphor you want to, but it's also kind of on Vince at the end of the day. Um, in that, that being his desire for his company. Um, around this time, uh, there, uh, there is a lot more tension. The tension escalates between Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. Um, you'd mentioned the Sonny comment earlier. Um, uh, that actually resulted in Shawn being suspended, uh, from WWF at the time. Um, there were other things that happened. I believe there was a story about Shawn Michaels, um, uh, I guess, politicking his way into beating uh, the British Bulldog in England to win a championship, uh, something that was promised to British Bulldog at the time, and he'd even gone on a radio show and dedicated, uh, British Bulldog had dedicated his upcoming victory to his uh, sister who had cancer at the time. Um, and, and Sean, again, politicked his way into um, uh, winning the title instead. Um, for, for those who are more familiar with Shawn Michaels ladder work, the second half of his career, this might come across as very shocking. Uh, but Sean, the, the Shawn Michaels then and the Shawn Michaels, now are like night and day kind of people. Um, so, you know, if any of this comes across as very odd and unlike the Shawn Michaels that we know of uh, today, then, I mean, there, there's a, a good reason for that. Um, there is also a story about post, uh, 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 I guess, backstage comments, post house show, uh, Bret Hart, uh, claims that he had spoken with Sean um, about, hey, you know, let's be professionals. You know, if I'm ever asked to drop the title to you, I don't have a problem in doing so. If that's what Vince wants, that's what Vince wants. Yada, yada, yada. Um, he claims that Shawn Michaels' response is, you know, I really appreciate that, but if, you know, the shoe is on the other foot, I would not be willing to do the same for you, which resulted in a a, a big scuffle, a big argument uh, about this here. Um, so, uh, Rob, tensions escalating here in 1997 between the Hitman and the Heartbreak Kid. Yeah, and you know the the thing is, is I brought I brought up the Sunny storyline, um, or what Shawn Michaels said, but there was also a. Uh, um, Shawn Michaels also went pretty far with insulting Stu Hart. Like he went further than he was supposed to, and um, that that and the Shawn and the Shawn Michaels uh, uh, Sonny comment actually led to a a short suspension for Shawn Michaels. And I don't think people um, remember that too much. And I don't know if the the if the insult, insulting to Stu Hart. Uh, part was part of that suspension, but I know it was a big deal, um, bigger than it was, because it went further than than anybody realized. Like that wasn't. It was basically Shawn Michaels shooting in a way, you know, shooting mm. on Stu Hart because it went further than it was supposed to. Um, and it, it's just like Shawn, and you were right, Shawn Michaels compared to then and then like compared to like when he came back night and day and and sean has been on the record saying that he 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 like came across i'm i'm not i'm putting words into his mouth here but he he battled his like per se demons you know like Mm -hmm. and uh you know that that changed things for him for the better um and like he he got married he had he had children you know and and that changes people, you know, like we got to remember these wrestlers are people too. And, uh, that, that changed a lot of things. And eventually it, it, like you said, it, it was two different people in a way. Like you had, a, if you, if you look at it this way, you had Shawn Michaels who was just plain and simple, a jackass. And then you got Shawn <laughs> Michaels who, could still be 
a jackass in the bag, but he was at least better. You know, like he wasn't he wasn't getting high. He wasn't doing this. He wasn't Brett Bret Hart. You mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. I was talking about Sean. Like when oh. the difference between the two. Right. Like good and the and then when he came back, like you stated earlier. Oh you know, yes, and, yes, and, yes. Yeah. So it it was completely two different people, and and you know, like like you said, the Brett. The money wise, the money wise was just, it was incredible to get that twenty year contract like offer. Vince was doing basically what he he wanted to do because Brett wanted to stay in WWF. He did. Mm-hmm. That's that's what he wanted because he saw he saw that's where he saw like that's that's where he wanted to be. That was his future. He he loved what he did. Um. And it just Shawn Michaels politicked his way all the way to the to the title, and mm-hmm. and basically it came down to, I mean, the, the in the grand, if you look at it this way, Vince McMahon picked Shawn Michaels over Bret Hart, mm-hmm. is what he did. Um, and well, and and I think a lot of that comes down to Vince McMahon's realization as time is turning on here we're getting closer to survivor series and there's a lot of moving pieces to this story but vince at some point realizes he cannot afford to keep bret hart on this 20-year deal because again he's trying to get the company to go public he's trying to meet these financial constraints that he has and this is kind of one of those really big dominoes to fall here on Brett's part. You know, I mean, you can go back and watch the Raws of 1996 and you see, you know, uh, (laughs) Justin Hawk Bradshaw and, you know, uh, you know, various different characters that, um, you know, uh, (laughs) that, that, that really were not larger than life compared to, you know, the, the, the eighties, the, 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 you know, the big becoming of WWF at the time. Yeah. Um, I mean, so the money was just not there on WWF's part, and they're realizing this with Bret Hart. Yeah, and and that was the thing. They, they, you're right. They, yeah, like you said, Justin Hogg Bradshaw. You know, they, you had Max Moon. Uh, Max Moon, mm-hmm. the Goon. You know, they, it, like they tried things. It just was miserable. Like it mm-hmm. just didn't work. And uh, it. Yeah, it just the money wasn't there for like Brett, and I don't know like what, in a way like what Vince could expect. You know, the everybody that watched wrestling at that time, like when it that dead part, a lot of kids were like kind of growing out of that phase because Hulk mm-hmm. Hogan wasn't on the screen anymore. Randy Savage wasn't wrestling, and it just kind of took away from that. And they kind of lost focus and moved on to something else. And it just, like you said, the money wasn't there. That's what it came down to. Mm-hmm. And you're, you're right. Vince knew he couldn't do that contract. And so that's one of the reasons why he picked Sean over Brett. Because mm-hmm. that money, now in the long... You, there's, there's a lot of things that I look at. Would the... Would we have the Stone Cold that we have then if it wasn't for Shawn Michaels and company? You know, right? Because that led Shawn Michaels led the the click basically changed wrestling for the most part in different ways. Because like that Shawn Michaels who was pretty much the head of the click, you know. I mean, they never had an official like top guy, but when you look at the names, Shawn Michaels is the top name on that list. And when he was losing his friends to WCW, that ties in the Madison square garden incident. And only one person could really be punished for that. And that was triple H Mm. and triple H was, was supposed to win the king of the ring that year. And stone cold, Steve Austin got it. So we don't get the Austin three sixteen probably without that. So that just shows like how big the click had a part in not only the Bret Hart like situation, like Shawn Michaels politicking his way in and other people just wanting to do whatever they could to get paid. Like they would 
they would try to be nice to the click or like you had some guys that just could not stand the click being around them. Mm-hmm. You know, that it, it played in different ways. Well, but, and, and, and obviously, you know, the click was hugely political, you know, uh, obviously a big Sean being a big part of that and kind of what, you know, what Sean wants, you know, they helped Sean get, um, but as as you know, the click kind of fragmented. You had Sean and Triple H and WWF. You had uh, uh, Kevin Nash and Scott Hall down in WCW. Uh, Sean Waltman, X Pac, One Two Three Kid, whatever you want to call him. He is kind of going back and forth uh, between the two. Um, and again, the the plan for for Vince was he wanted to have. Shawn Michaels and Bret Hart face each other at WrestleMania 13 as a rematch to the WrestleMania 12 match. That did not happen, uh, of course, because of the suspension. And Shawn talked about how he had an, a, an injury that he had to have surgery for. Um, of course, privately, he did not want to lose to Bret. And, you know, um, you know, the, I mean, that, that all kind of goes into 1997 further. Um Bret Hart has the the classic um, I quit match with Stone Cold Steve Austin at WrestleMania 13. Stone Cold becomes a star amongst stars. Like that's like the the big jumping off point for him. Um, you know, go, going into that Austin like that Stone Cold character. You know, that's what made him great. But he was not nearly as ready for the title as. Sean would would be or as Brett would be for Vince McMahon to just go ahead and give him the title um, all this time um, when Brett has the title in 1997 he's refusing to drop the title to, to Shawn Michaels because of the politics because of the things that Sean has said because of you know just a whole bunch of different factors uh, WWF is telling Brett we can't make this deal happen. Brett signs with WCW. But Brett wants to try and call the shot on how he leaves. And that becomes a big problem. Uh, you know, WWF and, well, Vince is pushing Sean. Hey, you know, let's look at your options. You can drop the title to Sean. Brett doesn't want to drop the title to Sean. They're talking about you know, hey, well, you can, um, I mean, th- we can have the match be a disqualification and you can drop the title to Ken Shamrock or Austin or whoever. Um, I think Brett ultimately wanted to drop the title to Austin, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, you can clarify that for me if you want to. Sorry, uh, sorry. I cut out for a second. What was that? No, you're good. Uh, Brett's Brett ultimately... I think his intention was he wanted to drop the title to Austin rather than Sean. Yeah. Um, but that's not what Vince wanted. Vince didn't think that Austin was ready at that point. Um, we get to a point where uh, Survivor Series 1997, it, it's nearing closer. The match is set. Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels at Survivor Series. It's in uh, Montreal, Canada, and Bret Hart's contract is nearly up. He's about to go to WCW, right? And uh, WWF is faced with a big problem. Bret is refusing to drop the title. They're trying to get, to basically give him every um, every option on the table, right? And Bret Bret doesn't want to drop the title to Sean, right? On the other hand, Vince is really nervous about the situation because on WCW, uh, uh, Medusa, the former Alundra uh, Blaze, rather, had uh, dropped the uh, WWF's Women's Championship in a trash can on live television. He, he wants to spare himself that sense of embarrassment, it seems, uh, for uh, for his company, and you know he doesn't want Brett to end up doing something similar on WCW television. Um, talk yeah. to me about what's going on 
you know, in the days before Survivor Series, Rob. Yeah, and what's like what's so fascinating about this is there were cameras following Bret Hart for the documentary Wrestling with Shadows. So a lot of this was was caught on tape or recorded, you know. So there was there was just so much going on. Um and Brett, you pretty much hit it on the head. Brett Brett did not want to go out that way. He wanted to go out the way that he just he discussed and you know it, it's always weird. I always think back, why did Brett just not sign like a like two or three day contract extension, you know, just something like just where he would not basically leave for WCW carrying that belt, you know, what, like why, you know, why did they not do that? That's something that I've always wondered about. And, you know, what Vince did was at the time, what he thought was best for the company. Um, he did, and I get it. You, I wouldn't want my, I would not want Bret Hart going on TV, throwing WWF championship in the belt or trash. Now the difference between Bret Hart doing Bret Hart. And I believe this a hundred percent. Bret Hart would have never done that because he respected WWF. He respected Vince. He said Vince was like a father figure to him. Like, Granted, he obviously he had Stu Hart, obviously was his dad. But when Brett was on the road, Brett could talk to Vince. You know, like like he trusted Vince. And I think the thing that that really is irritating is because I'm like like I said, it's irritating because I'm a Brett Hart fan, but. Mm. The fact that Vince let these different people, the clique basically, and and others, get into his ear and basically say, "Brett's gonna do this. Brett's gonna do that." So you gotta mm-hmm. get the belt away from him. Mm-hmm. Well, that that's fine, but Vince didn't talk to his right hand man, Pat Patterson, at all. Like, yeah, Pat Patterson did not know anything about this. Yeah, yeah, and, I, I've I've heard of. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interject, but like. I, I know of the stories of Vince, and for those who weren't aware, Vince talking to guys like Jim Ross and Jim Cornette and Vince Russo. Hey, this is the situation. I need ideas. What can we do here with this situation here? And, I mean, I've, I've heard Pat Patterson is involved, was part of the conversations. Pat Patterson wasn't involved in the conversations it, it, I mean, it's definitely very confusing. Yeah, and and from what I understand, and I believe Brett's been on the record saying, and I, I would need to check this, but I believe Brett said that that Pat Patterson did not know because Pat mm-hmm. Patterson was was very emotional about it. Mm. Um, he was very emotional about what happened, and it's kind of weird because when you go back and you you look at it, like what happened. The Undertaker didn't know about it. Right. Like the Undertaker was like Vince's guy. Like him and Brett were Vince's guys. But the Undertaker like was the basically Judge Dredd, you know, the Judge Jerry. <laughs> right. And like Undertaker and that's pretty much what it was. Undertaker went to Vince and on when Undertaker Undertaker went to Vince, he was pissed because he didn't know what happened. And then because of Vince saying this is what he did, Undertaker was like, okay, like it's fine. But Undertaker was pissed that he didn't know. There were a lot of people that would piss. Stone Cold Steve Austin was pissed. Uh, Mankind, uh, Mick, I believe, was Yeah, Mick Foley was famous, famously pissed. Yeah, the, um, I mean, there you had pretty much, and, from what I understand, everybody was pissed except for Triple H and Shawn Michaels. <laughs> and, and, and we'll we'll get to the the reaction, the post reaction here. Um, but let's let's um, let's dial in here. We're getting to day of Survivor Series. Um, basically, um, there's a phone call that's made uh, between Vince and Triple H. Um, you know, Vince is trying to come up with a way for him to get the title off of Brett, who is leaving to WCW, and 
and and going or uh, and leaving WWF, going to WCW. Uh, Brett is adamant he'll drop the title. He just doesn't want to drop the title to Sean. That that being his big point here, and Vince is very untrustworthy of that being the case because of everything else that's been going on. Jim Cornette is alleged to have said that the screw job idea came from him because of a match that had previously happened uh, with the fabulous Mula, where the referee uh, proceeded with a three count after Mula just held down onto her opponent and took the title off of her. Right. Um, a, a screw job, if you will. Uh, so Jim Cornette has pitched this idea to Vince Vince is on the phone with Shawn Michaels, and he's trying to tell him this idea. Shawn's not super receptive to this, and Triple H, of all people, interjects and is alleged to have said, Vince, one of them is staying, the other one is leaving, the choice is simple. And at that point, it's alleged that Vince knew that he had to go in this direction. So, uh, day of survivor series, Sean is super worried about this. There's even stories of, uh, Gerald Briscoe getting, uh, involved and telling Sean about how to defend himself in the instance that Brett flips out and shoots on Sean. Um, and, and, you know, all of these other, uh, fantastic stories. um, (laughs) <laughs> what what's what's weird is we people always talk about the Survivor Series 1997 screw job aspect of it, but but Rob, what are your memories of the match itself? Because the match itself is actually not bad. Yeah, the match was fine, and and the, now to, this is where it gets funny uh, for me. Is I ordered the pay per view. I'm a 15 year old kid watching this and. I'm thinking, you know, there's a lot of rumors right now that Brett's going to lose this title and go to WCW, Mm -hmm. but it wasn't official. You know, at that time we didn't have, I mean, the internet was obviously around, but it wasn't wrestling on the internet. Wrestling internet wasn't what it is now, you know? So it's right. Like this is what the rumor is. And all of a sudden this match is going good. And all of a sudden I'm like, what the hell just happened? Like, Shawn Michaels barely didn't put that on good, and Brett's not going to tap out for that. I'm wondering if I missed a Bret Hart tap out. And then they go, then I see what Vince McMahon was doing, and then I see the loogie <laughs> hitting Vince McMahon on the side. That's like, And I was like, something's not right. And then I see Brett spelled WCW. Mm. I don't, or maybe that was later. I, I think that was later. I saw that somebody had a, somebody recorded that. I don't remember if that part was on tape or on the pay-per-view, but I remember seeing it later that night, um, the WCW hand motion. Mm. And um, and that was when I was like, I don't, I, like, I don't know, maybe this is a work, who knows? I'm like, it's just weird. And then uh, I remember the next day reading Meltzer, like, I'm like, Melt, like I'm, you know, I I just didn't want to believe it, and mm. Meltzer pretty much saying this this happened, you know, he's been on the phone all night with people, like he he basically said, and and uh, and it was just it was just it was a good match, but it just the aftermath is where the, it gets even crazier, believe it or mm-hmm. not, like just. It, it was a decent match, obviously, like you said. It just mm-hmm. the ending came out of nowhere, you know. Mm-hmm. Like you're, you're you're seeing Earl Hebner like calling for the bell, like he's never called before. Like he looked. Mm-hmm. Um, Bret Hart knew right away what happened. Mm-hmm. Shawn Mike was obviously acting. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well, he he got he got out of there. So so yeah. so the Montreal match again for those uninitiated. Errol Hebner is the referee. He's in on this screw job idea. The the device being Sean will put the sharpshooter on Brett at a point in the match and Earl Hebner will ring for the bell 
and Sean and Earl need to get the heck out of Dodge and leave the ring because Brett is going to, you know, <laughs> Brett Brett is going to have a very uh, real, a very guttural reaction uh, to everything going on here. And as you pointed out, Sean puts the sharpshooter on Brett at the at that point in the match, uh, and Earl rings the bell. Brett does not tap out, and all hell breaks loose. Brett sees Vince at ringside. He spits on Vince. He he hand signs WCW in the air. He looks disgusted with everything that's happened. He's throwing camera monitors. He's he's obviously super upset, right? Yeah. And as you pointed out earlier. All the meanwhile, they're recording the documentary Wrestling with Shadows, you know, and they've got this behind the scene aesthetic here of shooting this movie. Brett goes in his locker room. He, you know, he tells Vince, you know, that he's going to knock him out if he sees him after he gets out with his shower. Obviously, Undertaker confronts Vince. And he's super upset. He tells Vince he needs to go and talk to to, to Brett, um, and that's where Vince, you know, goes into Brett's locker room and tries to tries to make amends here, unsuccessfully. Uh, there's the story of Brett punching Vince, allegedly. <laughs> oh, he did. He did. They. It's been admit or Shane McMahon, I think, said it too. Like it, it happened. The punch happened. Um. Yeah. So, and he literally did not vent out. Um. And it, and what was like what I mentioned earlier that a lot of the wrestlers are pissed. M- uh, Mick Foley, he like was the biggest one pissed, and he actually, um, he basically sat out the next night. Like he he did. He sat out the next night. Brett. Um, had wrestlers contact him and he told them to fill their contractual obligations like um, Undertaker basically told Vince like you need to talk to these guys because you might not have much of a roster mm. because that's the thing like people still don't understand today that ro- that locker room is like a sacred place like mm. Vince McMahon I mean there people. some people are not allowed in that locker room like even if they're higher ups, that's like the that's like the Undertaker rule. Like you you don't get to go in that locker room, you know. Mm-hmm. That's, and that's the thing. Like you got all these people just Brett was respected. That's the easiest way to say it. Bret Hart was respected by pretty much everybody. Shawn Michaels was not. And you do this to your, you do this to the guy that was respected, and you basically. You're basically telling us that you will you would throw us under the bus if it came down to it, you know. Like that's the way that a lot of those guys have said they looked at it. They looked at it that way. And the thing is, is you had <laughs> Bret Hart had his family with him. Like his his he had Jim Neidhart with him. He had Davy Boy Smith. He had Owen Hart with him. You know, they they were like his family was there. You know, and <laughs> it just. Um, like Bret Hart's wife was there. She she yelled at Triple H. Mm-hmm. Um, like it, it was just it it just it it was to be a fly in the wall that night would have just been like the most. It's the it's wrestling's most cra- like it's easily wrestling's craziest night ever. And like when you think about it from a from a behind the scenes standpoint, it, it just I don't think anything could ever top that. And that's just how absolutely nuts this whole situation was. It just and it went crazy because Vince McMahon was afraid of his title being thrown in the trash. And the thing is is there, there's people that have their conspiracy theories about this. And the only thing I can honestly say about all of it, without a shadow of a doubt, Bret Hart would have never 
of throwing that belt in the trash. He mm-hmm. wasn't that kind of guy. He just wouldn't have done it. Right. Would have Shawn Michaels at that time? Absolutely. If the if the if the roles were reversed, hundred percent, I believe Shawn Michaels would throw that belt in the trash. But that's the thing. Bret Hart wouldn't have done that. And there there's there's all kinds of like theories out there. And but the fact that this happened when it didn't need to happen is just it's it's crazy. Like I mean and like you you had you had Pat Patterson visibly upset. You had um it's just that locker room just was they were beside themselves and and you know the 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 one thing we're forgetting about out of this is the fans. The fans were throwing trash. They weren't yep. happy. Yeah. Oh, Vince. I don't think Vince returned to Montreal on TV for what five years later. Yeah. I think, and it <laughs> it just went it just went, and maybe it was even longer than five years. But like. It was a long time. I would have for to sure. check, but yeah, it was. It was like, I mean, people were affected like big time. Can like, Bret Hart fans were were upset, you know. And eventually, a lot of us <laughs> came back to the WWF side. I know I, I completely stopped watching when Bret when Bret left. I mm-hmm. was just like so mad, and um, and then all of a sudden, it's like, okay, well. Owen Hart wrestling. I like Owen, so I'll watch Owen. And then it's like mm-hmm. this Stone Cold guy. He's getting better and better, it's, you know. And it just got better. Like it, it got better. And now it's like I still love Bret Hart, but I can't watch this WCW stuff because Austin's going to beat up his boss, <laughs> you know. Well, and you kind of just touched on something here that I mean is is the end result here of the Montreal screw job it is the, the birth of the Vince McMahon character. I mean, he goes on to be interviewed later in a very WWF, you know, style interview where he infamously says, I didn't screw Brett. Brett screwed Brett, you know, um, and that resonates with people. People are now, uh, you know, I think people there is a lot of people who always knew that Vince was the owner of WWF, but still. I mean, on screen, you really only knew Vince McMahon as, you know, the color commentator, you know, right? The play-by-play guy. And now there's this, you know, the the veil has been lifted of th- this is actually the scenario. Vince is the owner of WWF. He's calling these shots, and this is what he did to Bret Hart and so on and so forth. Um you know, all the while Stone Cold Steve Austin, as you pointed out, he's getting hotter and hotter. You know, I mean, there's I mean, there was the segment with Austin and uh, Mike Tyson, uh, which was one of the hottest things that's ever happened in the history of pro wrestling. Them two getting in the ring and getting in each other's faces and then having to be separated legitimately by security well not legitimately but it's separated by security you know i mean that's one of the biggest things that's ever happened in the history of pro wrestling and you know and that's all kind of i want to say thanks to this event but had there not been the montreal screw job we wouldn't have vince mcmahon the character we wouldn't have uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin. We won't have a, a person for Stone Cold Steve Austin to be so retaliatory against as he got hot. Yeah. You, you know, I mean, the 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 fabled Attitude Era in and of itself, the the face of it would be completely changed had it not been for the events of 1997. Um, and and it's kind of incredible. Uh, how this all transpired. Um, obviously, post Montreal, um, Brett did not have the greatest of times in WCW. I feel like it was a pretty bad fit for him. Mm-hmm. Um, Sean 
would uh, go on to injure his back uh, during a match with The Undertaker, resulting in his ultimate retirement, uh, short-term retirement, um, post-WrestleMania 14, where he dropped the title to to Austin. Um, Michaels would come back in 2002 and face Triple H in a wonderful no-holds-barred match. Um, for the uh, uh, well, no no titles on the line. It was just his return to pro wrestling, and it was just um, it, it was just a really um, a important event in, in the history of pro wrestling. Um, of course, this is not where the story ends. Um, in two thousand and ten. Bret Hart uh, would make his return to WWE television um, as a guest host for Raw. And him and Shawn Michaels essentially buried the hatchet um, then at that point. Um, You know, they had made amends of who they were. Shawn Michaels was a very different person uh, than what he had been. Bret Hart had obviously grown uh, older himself and uh i mean he'd even um th- they'd even complimented each other in the media uh previously you know sean saying that he he you know uh, talking about how much of a joy bret hart was to work uh to work within the ring you know these men had gotten older and again buried the hatchet on that famed january 4th episode of monday night raw yeah, exactly, and and they like it was so it was so weird. Like, I I don't know. Did you watch that raw? I did. Yeah, he, I don't know about you. Maybe because I was such a big Hitman fan, I was watching with like and like I was like just I was on pins and needles. You know, I'm like watch. I'm like something's gonna happen. Something's gonna happen. And, and then Shawn Michaels stopped. And then I thought he was gonna. Hit, Kick Brett, and then they hugged, and I was like, "Okay, I was still not over until she, until Sean's out of that ring. I don't believe any of this." And it it took a while, and I was like, "Holy crap, my guy's back in WWE!" Yeah, and, uh, it was just so it was just so like crazy that it it took so long. And and Brett was on the record saying that he doesn't know if he would have came back if it wasn't for that Ultimate Warrior DVD that they put out, the self destruction. He was so afraid of them doing something like that that he went back because mm-hmm. he didn't want his legacy tarnished. And uh, in a way, well, obviously, in a way, that's awful that that some that they would do that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but they did it. They did it to Ultimate Warrior, and then they worked a deal out where he came back, and WWF pretty much got rid of that DVD. I mean, the only copies you'll ever see are the ones on secondary market now. Mm-hmm. I mean that they act like that. That's that's like to give you an example. That's like uh, just uh, basically a student. Like the best way to pr- announce it, or to give you an example of that DVD about it getting put like basically off the shelves. WWF not ever talking about it. It's kind of like the old 1994 Fantastic Four movie that you could only find like a work print of, like or like a. Uh, like a copy of it. There was no official version, no release um, for the longest time. And uh, it was, it, it reminds me of that. You just, it doesn't exist anymore unless you mm. find a secondary copy. And uh, WWE, for the most part, wishes you never would have saw that now. Um, but that was their way of saying, oh, you don't want to work with us? Here you go. And Brett, right. was, Brett was afraid of that. And obviously, Brett had a lot of problems with WWE. He, he, he has stated before that his brother Owen would still, well, his brother would have, what happened in Kansas City wouldn't have happened if Brett was still with the company. Um, and it's something that Brett um, has said in the interview, too, is that if he would have, he, he thinks his children, things would have been different for his children. Like, he... he his two sons had a real interest in being pro wrestlers, and he thinks if he would have stayed with WWE, that they would be wrestlers, or at least they would have tried. Not, not he just he was maybe like just stating an opinion, but 
you said a lot of things changed, you know, and it it wasn't the same. Like wrestling, he, you know, Bret Hart and wrestling, it was kind of like a really bad divorce. WCW just took a lot out of him for obvious reasons. And, uh, and then he, he was hurt, you know, like hurt, uh, physically hurt emotionally. The business that he loves, he loved just came back and Shawn Michaels, Shawn Michaels like had a back injury and he came back and, you know, the, the thing is, is it, it just got to him and he, he came back to, I mean, he came back for other reasons. He got, I mean, he got paid obviously to, to come back. So I bet that was a big part of it, but he also did that. The one thing that I'll say that he did that, he also did it not only for himself, but he did it for his fans too. You know? Right. Like fans, fans wanted it, you know, like, and I did like when I feel like the, I, I always felt that if, granted, Bret Hart went into the Hall of Fame earlier than 2010, mm-hmm. you know, but I still didn't feel like everything was complete until Bret showed up on that Raw, that episode of Raw. And I felt, I remember feeling, as weird as it sounds, I was feeling relieved that Bret was on camera again. in On Monday night, where I always got to watch him wrestle, either then or Sundays, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, and it felt like it was one of those things where I'm glad that they uh, that him and Sean uh, buried the hatchet. You know, they had a truce, as they say. And mm-hmm. uh, I mean, Brett is still very outspoken. He, but what I what I like about Bret Hart is he always he is he speaks. What what he thinks is he'll say he doesn't. Yeah, have, he is. He he doesn't have that. I guess filter. You know what I mean. He he will. Right. He is. He is right on there. So I mean, he still has problems with Goldberg. He still has problems with Triple H. Yeah. Like, he know, he he definitely comes across as one of the most genuine people in all of pro wrestling. And strangely enough, I mean, even though Sean still works for. WWF and he's kind of more constrained to what he can say. I think Sean also comes across as one of the more genuine people, you know, that you'll find in wrestling just because of how he's grown as a person. Yeah, I mean he he gives a lot of media interviews outside of WWE and when the subject of bread is brought up or other subjects, I mean he's very yeah, I mean, he's very open. I mean, Shawn Michaels was the first person that you had um, on the W. I don't know if you remember the WWE Confidential series, <laughs> but Shawn was the first person profiled on that, you know, about him and his recovery and him becoming a born again Christian and all this and that. This was leading actually right up to his return, essentially, to, to, to working in WWF um, in 2002. Um, uh, let, let's bring this home then, Rob. Um, uh, and we've probably answered this question so many times over the course of this last 80 plus minutes, but, uh, ultimately to you, why should people care about Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels? Two of the greatest to ever do it. Literally two of the greatest to ever do it. And that's not... That's let's take the microphones out of it. You watch your matches, you're gonna get a good match. Bret Hart can make anybody look like gold. Bret Hart is has never hurt anybody in the ring. He like he he's been on the record about that. He's never he, he's never like made out like I mean, you're not gonna feel good after a wrestling match by any means, but he never nobody ever got really hurt wrestling him. He was that good. He, and he was sound. He made it look. It's going to sound cliche, but he made wrestling look like art. I mean, he really did. He, it was it was smooth. Shawn Michaels, in a different way, was the same exact way. He made it look smooth. He, he. he I don't. In my opinion, the two best people. In my and this is my opinion that take bumps 
are Shawn Michaels and Ric Flair. I don't think anybody takes bumps the way those two guys do. And that's that's Shawn Michaels making the other guy look good. I mean, Shawn Michaels looked good at the ring always. You know, I mean, did he kind of overdo it sometimes? Sure. I mean, yeah, everybody thinks about that Hogan summer. <laughs> you know, the you know. octo- octopus in a uh, in a dryer uh, performance that he had. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But and that's the thing. But that's why I think people should care. Um, is if you take everything out of it, if you if you don't, and Brett was good on the microphone too. I mean, he was. It's, but if you just watch a match, I mean, that that Brett. I mean, you, there's so many matches that Brett had that were so good. You had Brett versus Stone Cold at Mania 13, like you said earlier. You had Brett versus Mr. Perfect at SummerSlam 91, I think. Bret Hart versus Davey Boy Smith at 92 SummerSlam. He, and he just Brett, had, Brett and Owen, WrestleMania yeah, 10. Brett Owen, Brett Owen, like everybody talks about the WrestleMania 10 match. Their SummerSlam 94 and a steel cage match was really good, too. Yeah. And and they, that's the thing with Bret Hart. He had some fantastic matches. And then you go to Shawn Michaels. His matches with The Undertaker, his like when he came back, his matches with uh, Triple H, Chris Jericho, him and Chris Jericho, I think people do not talk about their feud enough. I think that's one of the best WWE feuds that we ever got to see, and I don't think people talk about that one as much. Um, he's, he had great matches, he, um, and, and he made you laugh like with the DX stuff. When him and Triple H... The, the their DX stuff, they still show the uh, the the Stan like uh, clip where he super kicks Sean Spears. I mean, he wasn't Sean Spears at the, or you know what I mean. He yeah. super kicks Sean Spears. He's holding the paper. He kicks. He just kicks random. Gives super kicks. I mean, they still show that as one of the best. It's one of the best raw moments. Just him and DX, and and he's part of that. He he just had fantastic matches. He and he and he. Put him on the line, you know. He, he, him and Ric Flair had that famous WrestleMania match where he retired Ric Flair. You know, there's just he, he, he's a, he's like Brett. They put it on the line. They, they had great matches, and that's that's what's great about both men. They, they, they just put on great matches, and I think we're really lucky to be able to have. To be able to say we can watch those guys still, like with uh, like on Peacock, you know, you get to if you want to, you can watch pretty much almost any of their matches. And I would recommend anybody to watch their matches because um, you'll see a good one. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't sum it up any better than you did. Obviously, Brett and Sean, uh, generational talents. I mean, you you won't find two classier wrestlers, you know, from a performance standpoint, from a pure standpoint, than Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. I mean, you look at the list of WWE's greatest matches of all time, and that's going to be littered with Bret matches and Shawn matches from top to bottom. Yeah. Um, and, and there's there's other ones, obviously. I mean. The like you have just some of the classics like Triple H and Stone Cold have are not together, but like there's so many wrestlers that have great matches, you know. But when it comes to that time period, Bret Hart, Shawn Michaels, man, they 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 were the show, and uh, it's one of those things where Shawn Michaels. And and I said it plenty of times. They both could just have outstanding matches anytime they wanted. And and the funny thing is, anytime they were in that ring, they did that. They wanted to have a great match, no matter who they wrestled. I mean, Bret Hart and One Two Three Kid on that Raw had a great match. Um, Bret had some great matches with Hakushi, um, and even like Jerry the King Lawler. I mean. He, he had a great feud with, you know, that's that's just the great thing about Bret Hart. And I could go on about those two all night. And I literally say that I'm 
I feel lucky that I got to watch those guys like in their prime. Um, do I think about Brett's WCW career? No, I don't think about it. I know like we got some great matches out of some some good matches out of his WCW career, and do I? It, it, that part sucks, but you know I I'm. Uh, it's just easy, easiest way to say it is I'm grateful that we got to watch those two go, and uh, it's too bad they still can't go. <laughs> now it would, it would not be ne- nearly the same. Uh, Brett had some health issues, and uh, he's a little bit slower than he used to be, obviously, as he's gotten older. But um, I mean, you still people still talk to him. I was talk about him to this day about dream matches. I mean, the the one thing that people always talk about, Kurt Angle just said it on his podcast, that Bret Hart was his dream match. Um, I think Kenny Omega's been on the record saying that to wrestle Bret Hart would have been, like, one of his top dream matches. You know, you know there's just a lot of wrestlers have said that. Uh, like, FTR, they, they've been on the record saying they were huge Bret Hart fans, you know, just, and they actually got into it with Road Dog at one time, like, because they didn't really care for Shawn Michaels. You know, it, it's just... It's just... And that's what's funny, is... Back in the day, you were... You weren't... Necessarily, you were not a fan of both guys. You were one or the other. Mm-hmm. And I was always a Bret Hart guy. And when... If somebody was to listen to this podcast, you would definitely hear me be more pro Bret. But... As I've gotten older... I understand that Sean changed and I truly appreciate what he's given to this business. And mm. I, I, I love Shawn Michaels. I love Bret Hart. And I, again, I'll say it for the hundredth time. I think we're lucky as hell that we got to watch these guys in their prime. Yeah. I mean, 100% Rob, I, I couldn't have summed it up any better myself. Um, where can the people, uh, the good people at home, the good people listening, find more of your content. <laughs> uh, you can find me on Twitter at Rob Wilkins. Mm. Um, I cover uh, NXT every Tuesday night on Fightful. I also cover AEW every Wednesday night on Fightful. I have my own feature um, on Fightful Select where I cover uh Everything outside of the ring when it comes to wrestling collectibles, um, we're talking wrestling shirts, trading cards, action figures. I do, I do uh, stories on those. Um, and then you could find me on Shooting the Sportish eventually again, um, where I cover sports. I talk about baseball, do a little talk of wrestling, and go from there. Awesome, man. And uh, I know I've said it before here on this series, obviously, with this one most likely being one of the last episodes that that gets put onto the um, uh, the streams. Um, you've been a an enormous wealth of knowledge and resource here covering these topics. And I can't thank you enough for for wanting to be involved in and covering not only this show, uh, but the other ones that we've talked about as well. So uh, I sincerely appreciate you coming on and talking with us here Uh, for those podcasters out there listening. If you have not reached out to Rob, uh, you're foolish not to, because he can be uh, one of the, the best uh, guests that you can have as far as, wanting to have a historical conversation about wrestling. Rob's Rob's one of the absolute best in the business, and I can't thank you enough uh, for for taking part in this little journey with me here. Um, It was my pleasure, and uh, by all means, I I do want to state that I really appreciate you letting me do this with you, and um, (laughs) I will say that my memory is not as great as it was, but I'm pretty 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 confident that i got most of like my facts right timeline might not be the same but i pretty much know i this story is something that's been with me for over i mean we're we're talking 25 years now Mm -hmm. it's been with me for 25 years so um it's definitely the biggest wrestling story that affected me because Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing i did not say in this i missed school the next day I was so oh. devastated. I skipped school <laughs> the next day. That's how much this messed with me. Now, granted, I watched ECW tapes all the next day, but um, <laughs> I, w- I was devastated, and I did not go to school. 
<laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, crazy, huh? It's pretty awesome. Um, stay in school, kids. Stay in yeah, school. Stay in school. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, uh, you can definitely check out Rob's content. He's he's fantastic. I appreciate him. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Texas Gentleman underscore or just on Twitter at Headlock Talk, uh, where you can find this stream. It's also going to be on Love Wrestling. So if you're listening to Love Wrestling and for whatever reason you haven't subscribed to Love Wrestling, uh, what are you doing? What are you thinking? Just hit that subscribe button. Come on. It's not that hard. Uh, (laughs) But yeah, you can also check out more of my content as well. Since uh, Headlock Talk will be retiring, um, you can definitely check me out over uh, on A Change in Attitude with my good friends Mags and Ori, where we are reviewing Monday Night Raw uh, week in, week out, starting uh, post King of the Ring 1996. Um, as well as Radio Techers, which has started its own YouTube and Twitch channels. Radio Techers is where me and Mags and uh, our friend uh, Matt Willis uh, talk about uh, the Premier League, the English Premier League, uh, some some real football, if you will. Um, and uh, we also talk about Champions League and other soccer and football-related matters. Um, so check out my content. Check out Rob's content. Check out the content from Love Wrestling. Uh, But until next time, I am the Texas Gentleman Tanner Pruitt. And for Rob Wilkins, we thank you for tuning in and have a great rest of your evening. Bye-bye.